Welcome back from lunch. Hope everyone enjoyed enjoyed the lunch over there. Um, it, it's my pleasure to uh, to welcome our, our next speaker. Uh, he, he comes to us from from the U.S. State Department, uh, where he most recently served as the U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, where he just finished that post in February of this year. Um, uh, ambassador Michael Mahalik, and um, he's also serving on the the APEC 2011. Uh, Host committee as a senior advisor, which is which is how we got him here for the the symposium on on APEC. And uh, I had to pull a, a, a bait and switch to get him to come here. I had to um, confuse him and, and make him think he was going to Portland State instead of Portland Community <laughs> College. So, so we're lucky to have him here today. Um, a little bit about the ambassador. He's a he's a career foreign service officer who's uh, spent most of his adult life in Asia or traveling between Asia and Washington. Um, He's worked in Tokyo, Sydney, Australia, Islamabad, uh, and Beijing, and of course, Washington. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I, I give to you uh, Ambassador Mike Mahalik. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Well, I certainly hope that everybody did have a good lunch. I'm well aware of the boa constrictor effect. So I will, I will try to make some remarks somewhat, uh, somewhat interesting here. I see. Yes, they want me to use this thing. Okay. Very good. Um, today what I'd like to talk to you a little bit is first of all, I'd want to thank very much the, uh, the PCC as well as the East-West Center for putting on this uh, in this, what is it, the second or third, I guess, in the series of internationalization discussions here at PCC. And I think that that in and of itself is a wonderful thing. I very much enjoy coming out and talking to, uh, to universities, to community colleges, to high schools, to just about anybody who will listen to me. And uh, it's because I really value education. It's one of the things that I consider to be one of the most important things uh, in my life and certainly in the lives of, of our children uh, going forward and uh, in the lives of, of people around the world. Uh, when I was before the Senate, at my confirmation hearings before going out to Vietnam, I promised the senators that I would double the number of students uh, going from Vietnam to uh, American colleges and universities. By the end of my tour, we had actually tripled the number of Vietnamese students. Vietnam went from being like number 13 in terms of sending countries to the United States to being number eight. And the demand is still extremely high there for uh, for uh, kids wanting to come to the United States. Uh, the reason, I think, is because they realize that the United States does have one of the best education systems in the world, particularly uh, higher education. Now, we all complain about it, and we all uh, have our own ideas on how it ought to change, and that's fine, and we ought to continue to improve it, but um, certainly in the eyes of the rest of the world, uh, one of the global standards on education is the United States, so it's really good for, for me to be here. Now, some of the context in which, uh, in which we're meeting here is uh, the fact that, well, I don't know what kind of culture we're going to have over the next five to ten years after hearing Andrea speak. I know it's just going to be different from what it is today because of all of the economic uh, turmoil that we're going through right now. But I have a feeling that it's going to contain a very high percentage of internationalization. Uh, if my daughter is any indication, I don't think she has spent any of her college vacations in the United States at all. She has traveled all over Asia, all over uh, India, all over uh, Europe, uh, and she still has not reached the age at which I took my first airplane flight. So, I mean, it's just amazing what's, what is going on today. Uh, with children. And when you look around the world, because of the economic, uh, uh, economic straits that we find ourselves in, um, it's pretty clear that we are not going to be the engine of growth going forward. And the engine of growth going forward is going to be the emerging economies, and it's going to be the emerging economies in Asia. In fact, most of the, uh, the APEC countries are projected to grow at at least 5.5% with uh, several of them growing higher than that, and especially China, and God only knows what they're going to grow at, uh, depending on whether or not you believe their statistics anyway. But it's going to be high. You can, you can count on that. So I think that the, uh, the impetus for PCC to continue to do these kinds of, uh, uh, these kinds of seminars is, is very high, very high indeed. 
PCC is, is the kind of a place where, well, most community colleges were set up originally to, uh, to kind of serve the needs of the community in which they were. But when you get to be as big a community college as PCC, I think the vision for the future of this college also needs to, needs to expand and needs to grow. And I think that working in conjunction uh, with the East-West Center on the, uh, the Asian Development Program is an excellent way to broaden the vision of the, uh, the faculty, broaden the vision of the school, and broaden the vision of the students. Some of the students are going to take the two years, that's going to be enough for them, and they'll go off and they'll earn good money and, and get good jobs. And many of them are going to start companies. They'll start probably SMEs. The Northwest is famous for having a very high percentage of, of uh, workers in, in small and medium-sized enterprises. And uh, the Commerce Department did a study from 2004 to 2009 in which they interviewed over 5,000 uh, SMEs. And they found that those SMEs that exported saw their revenue, their bottom line, increase 35% over the period of the study. Those SMEs that did not have exports in their business plan saw their revenue drop by 7%. So again, another reason why getting uh, acclimated to international, getting uh, understanding what, uh, what can be done uh, by looking beyond our own borders uh, is another reason for doing the, the kind of seminars that we're doing here. So we're going to be looking more at emerging economies, and most of APEC is emerging economies. We have, uh, APEC has got 21 economies. Uh, in fact, the slogan for this year is 21 economies for the 21st century, which I think is pretty cool. But um, it, is, uh, uh, it is amazing that our exports to APEC uh, are probably greater than those that we have to Europe. Uh, greater than we have to any other uh, block of countries around the world. Uh, so APEC is, uh, is an aggregation of, of uh, economies. And the reason that we say economies is because when APEC was formed in 1989, it was set up as a meeting of economic ministers. The leaders were not involved in it at all. It took until 1993 when uh, one month before the meeting of economic ministers, which was going to take place in Seattle, out in Blake Island, President Clinton said, I'm going to go, and not only am I going to go, but I want all of my colleagues from all of the economies to come along too. So in one month, the organizing committee had to put together a meeting. At that time, I think it was only 18 economies uh, to come together at Blake Island. Now, if any of you have ever been involved in a presidential visit, then you know one month out to be told that you're going to be doing this thing. You got to make sure that you got hotels, you got to make sure you got rental cars, you got to make sure you got security. It's a horrendous undertaking. And thank God I was not involved in it. But uh, <laughs> my friends with whom I work now were. And they tell me, the good news is we only had a month, so nobody could second guess our plans. The bad news is we only had a month, and we really had to get stuff Get, our, get squared away before, the, uh, before all the leaders came. But anyway, so it went, APEC went from the uh, uh, meeting of economic ministers to becoming a meeting at which the heads of state of some of the most economically powerful countries in the world uh, would come. So uh, this is a, yet another reason why uh, teaching kids now about international, about Asia, about APEC is something that, that I think is, is extremely important. APEC stands for the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. So it's four adjectives in search of a noun. And we usually say it's the APEC Forum. So Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. Now, why do we want to talk about APEC? You know, the other night, the other night uh, Don Hellman had quite a bit to say about APEC, and Don is a good friend. And I've talked with him about APEC before, and I will talk with him about APEC again. Uh, but uh, uh, APEC was never set up to be a negotiating forum. Uh, it was always set up to be a consultative group where people would get together to discuss ways in which we could increase the economic efficiency of all of the economies within APEC. Now, we call them economies and not countries. Because in 1990, when uh, we were trying to get China to come into APEC, 
We also, uh, we were also under a great deal of pressure to bring in Hong Kong and Taiwan. And Hong Kong and Taiwan, strictly speaking, are not countries. So the solution was, it's, it was called Hong Kong, China, and Chinese Taipei, and the members are not countries, they're economies. So that's why we, we keep saying economies, because if we ever say countries, the Chinese get very upset, and that's more hassle than it's worth to deal with. <laughs> so now, uh, what has APEC done? Huh? Uh, APEC, everybody says it's a talk shop. Well, I guess that depends on your point of view. Because yes, it's a talk shop, and yes, we don't do any negotiations. But we do come up with some pretty good ideas. One of the ideas that we came up with was uh, in the, about 1997, I think, just as the Uruguay trade round was ending, uh, I think it was the United States that, that uh, set it up. But we decided to start an initiative within APEC whereby countries would agree to make best efforts to go to zero tariffs on all uh, digital equipment, on IT equipment, including cell phones. And we got it passed within APEC. The leaders signed off on it and said, yes, this would be a great idea. Let's go ahead and try and do it. Well, the United States then took that, took that quote unquote agreement and took it to the WTO and proposed in the WTO that we make this one of the rules of the Uruguay round. And since we already had 18 countries, 18 of the most powerful countries within the WTO uh, that had agreed to it, we were able to get it through the WTO and uh, uh, it became part of the regulations of the Uruguay round. And Motorola and Intel and an awful lot of the IT companies are now very, very happy because they're making a whole lot of money based on that. Right now we're working to expand that because uh, from 1997 to today, obviously the whole IT uh, landscape has changed and now there are a whole lot of new products, data services and other uh, issues that would benefit from similar treatment and so we're working on that uh, even as we speak. Some of the other things that we've done is uh, customs. Harmonization of customs uh, is uh, always a, uh, one of the key objectives uh, of the private sector in working with APEC. The private sector's objectives for APEC in general would be to form what we call a, a seamless commercial environment for the 21st century. And by seamless commercial environment, we mean uh, absolute free movement of goods, services, data, money, uh, people throughout the APEC region. So um, we did a project the last time, or the first time I worked on APEC, I was uh, again seconded to uh, an NGO in Seattle called the National Center for APEC. And I worked with the private sector. We did a public-private partnership. I had about 10 companies, each of which put in a bunch of money. And we worked on modernizing customs operations at the port of Shanghai. And we trained about 400 Shanghai customs officers in the harmonized system of tariffs, a new tariff code uh, classification that came in with the Uruguay round. Uh, as well as upgraded their computer operations. And by the end of the day, we had shaved about three days off of uh, customs clearance operations uh, at the Port of Shanghai. And we had gotten regulatory changes from the Chinese government to allow uh, FedEx, UPS, and a couple of other express package delivery companies to invest in setting up a clearing operation uh, at, the, uh, at the Shanghai airport. So another sort of concrete thing which, uh, which APEC has, has, uh, has worked on. A couple of other things which I'm kind of proud of uh, because it happened while I was uh, in another APEC job. Uh, I, was the, uh, I was our senior official for APEC, which means I was the head of the United States delegation for, uh, for APEC. <coughs> and we got, in my working very closely with USTR, the US Trade Representative's Office, uh, we got an initiative which said that APEC would look for ways in which to come to a free trade area of the Asia Pacific, the FTAAP, we call it FTAP. And uh, at that time, I think the Japanese were talking about uh, setting up a free trade area of the ASEAN countries plus six, or the ASEAN countries plus three, or 
I think there was even one which was ASEAN countries plus eight, um, a number of different groupings. And we thought that it would be a good idea to have APEC lead the charge on this. So APEC went forward, it began doing some guidelines, that's generally what APEC is very famous for. We set up sort of informal rules of the road uh, as to uh, how to come to agreements on certain trade issues and uh, at that time I think there were about, oh, maybe 70 or 80 free trade agreements within the APEC area uh, and we were looking for ways to, to try to harmonize all this stuff because it was it looked like a noodle bowl if you, if you drew lines from between all of the countries that had free trade agreements. So from our guidelines emerged a free trade area called the P4. And the P4 consisted of Brunei, Singapore, New Zealand, and uh, shoot, one other and I can't remember which one it was, probably Australia, yeah, I think it was Australia. Um, and after that APEC year, which was 2006, it was the Vietnam year, uh, we began talking amongst ourselves within the U.S. government uh, about how we would go about doing a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. And we came up with several different ideas, uh, but then I had to leave uh, the APEC job because that was then named as ambassador to Vietnam. And about six months or so after I got to Vietnam, we announced the uh, the uh, beginning of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, which is now a group of nine countries that has had probably about six rounds of negotiations on setting up a new 21st century trade agreement uh, for uh, countries, all of which are APEC members, uh, that we hope will be the kernel of the, uh, of the FTAP. The idea being that uh, once these nine countries uh, figure out what they want for a trade agreement, other countries will be allowed to, to come in and join as they see fit to, uh, to, to respect the rules that, uh, that we've come together with. So that is another reason why uh, APEC is important and why it's going to be important, particularly this year, because the United States is hosting it. The, uh, let me, <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit, again, going back to the, to the question of, of uh, uh, whether or not APEC is a negotiating forum or not, uh, it's true it's not. In fact, that's one of the strongest arguments we have in trying to gain consensus within APEC. APEC is a consensus-driven organization. Any one country, any one economy can veto an initiative by simply saying, no, nope, we're not going to join the consensus, so forget it. So one of the arguments that we use with some of these countries, one of which in particular has uh, been a little bit obstreperous, it begins with a C and ends in an A, and it's not Canada, uh, is to say, look, this is non-binding. APEC is non-binding. You don't have to do any of this stuff. But if you think it's a good idea, go ahead, agree with it, and then if you don't want to do it, that's okay. And the Chinese always used to say to us, yeah, we know it's not binding, we know that that's true, but we know that if we agree to this, you Americans are going to be after us to do whatever it was we said we were going to do. So a lot of people, even though it's not binding, they treat it as binding, and we do get, <laughs> we do go after them and try and make them live up to what they said they were going to do. So that has worked out, worked out extremely, uh, extremely well. So just to give you a little bit of, of uh, APEC 101, I thought I would go through a sort of a typical APEC year because it is a whole year. Uh, during the year we have, oh, I would say about somewhere between 130 and 200 separate meetings. And these meetings, many of those are working group meetings. APEC has about 50 different uh, working groups working on, oh God, you know, disaster assistance, uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic uh, defenses. Uh, customs, various types of customs harmonization, rules of origin uh, work, uh, work on uh, open skies agreements for, uh, uh, for cargo uh, airplanes, for uh, passenger airplanes, uh, free movement of people, um, God, the list goes on and on and on. And there is, there is a, a folder that you get when you start to work on APEC that's about, oh, a quarter of an inch thick. And it contains all of the acronyms that are associated with APEC. There is the, uh, 
uh, HLPDAWG. <laughs> and <laughs> there is the CTI, and there is the CTF, and there is the, uh, oh, the, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So uh, each one of those acronyms corresponds usually to a working group or to, to something that, you, uh, that you're working on in APEC. Uh, so you got about 130 of these things, and they take place throughout the year. And throughout the year, you have, you've got four major meetings, which are meetings of the senior officials. The first meeting almost always takes place in capitals. So for us, this year, first meeting was in March uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. And that's a meeting where uh, all of the senior officials get together, you meet the new guys, uh, the new people who have come in to replace the old ones, and you begin to talk about your ideas for what kind of initiatives the host country wants to have during its APEC year. Uh, the second meeting uh, takes place generally sometime around June or July, and that is the uh, meeting of the trade ministers. So we have a meeting where all the trade ministers get together and they, they uh, talk about the issues of the day, they talk about whatever the initiatives are that you uh, propose during the first APEC meeting. Um, and then they will come up at the end of that meeting with a letter which they will uh, send to leaders saying, you know, these are the issues that we think you ought to work on. The third meeting of the year is one which we just had uh, for, for the United States year, but uh, uh, it is a meeting where you try to finish up the initiatives that you started in, uh, uh, at the first senior official meetings. And all during this time, you've had the working group meetings, which then feed into the senior official meetings, which feed into the ministerial meetings, which then feed into the leader meetings. So the third meeting is a pretty busy one because you're trying to get done all the stuff that you started in uh, January. But uh, we're all government workers, we're all bureaucrats, so of course we never get anything done by the third time or by the deadline that it was supposed to be. So then you come up to the fourth meeting, and the fourth meeting is a big one because that's when the leaders come. At the fourth meeting, you've got your senior officials meetings, then you've got a meeting of the, uh, the trade ministers and the foreign ministers, and then you've got a meeting of the leaders. Now, a dotted line off to the side is the finance minister's process. And I don't know if anybody's ever worked with uh, finance ministries around the world, but they are a very secretive bunch. They generally don't like to talk to anybody except each other, uh, which is not bad, which is not bad, because if you do talk to them, you can't understand what the hell they're talking about anyway. <laughs> but, and they're the guys who got us into this mess in the first place anyway. So uh, their, their input also feeds into this ministerial process. And then you've got the leaders meetings. The leaders generally meet for about a half a day or a day because they're all so busy that it's hard to get them to go anywhere for, for longer than a day or so. And they look at all the work that you've done and then they sign off on the leaders text. And that becomes uh, the blueprint for the next year and for uh, 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 declaring success for all of the initiatives that you've been working on all during the year. So in between these four meetings, you generally have all of the working group meetings, you have various ministerial meetings, um, and all of those meetings end up culminating in what happens uh, at the leaders' meeting. So this year, the leaders' meeting is going to be in Honolulu, which is a great place to have a meeting. Though I must admit, I'm getting, much as I love going to Honolulu, love meeting with the guys at the East-West Center, it's really a great time. But we have been there working on logistics, working on security, working on all of the different uh, uh, aspects of this meeting. I'm getting sick and tired of going to Honolulu, I tell you. It's, it's a terrible thing to say, but by golly, uh, you know, come November 14 when our events are done, I'm out of there. It's, yeah. So the other aspect of, of APEC that is extremely important, as uh, actually Don uh, Hillman referred to it uh, last night, is the involvement of the private sector. And that's really what I'm uh, most involved in this year. The private sector since about 1996 has been intimately involved in the APEC process. In 1996 at the Manila uh, APEC meeting, APEC created the, uh, the ABAC, another set of acronyms, the APEC Business Advisory Council. And the APEC Business Advisory Council is composed of three businessmen from each APEC economy. 
And these businessmen are often uh, chosen by the leaders of those economies, uh, or in our case, generally we submit some names and the White House uh, approves them. Um, and they are supposed to represent the voice of business uh, at APEC. And they also have four meetings a year, although they're being the private sector, they're more efficient. They generally get their work done on time, which is at the third meeting. And then at the fourth meeting, they formally present their recommendations to the, uh, uh, to the leaders to work on for the following year. So uh, at each one of the senior official meetings, we generally try to get more than just the, uh, the ABAC involved. And that's because uh, it doesn't matter how important these three uh, business leaders from each economy are, they can't represent the interests of all of the uh, businesses throughout the APEC region. So there are many groups that uh, get together to work on uh, assembling private sector opinions and, and working with the private sector to try and put their issues on the APEC agenda. For the United States, the uh, National Center for APEC, which is down in, in Seattle, is actually the secretariat for the United States delegation to ABAC. And this year, since we're hosting, the, uh, the NC APEC was chosen to head up the private sector efforts uh, for ABAC. I mean for APEC. So what they did is they went out to all of the other organizations. They went out to the U.S. Chamber, to the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, to the U.S. Uh, China Business Council and all of those types of organizations, brought them all together and said, okay, here's, here's kind of the plan, here's the layout. So they're acting, the National Center was acting as the coordinator for, uh, for the private sector input. And in order to make it uh, a national effort, the National Center created a new legal entity, uh, completely separate financially and you know, ethically and everything else, uh, called the, the, national, uh, the Private Sector Host Committee for APEC 2011. And in its wisdom, the State Department decided that they needed a high-level government representative to work with them to make sure that uh, A, we weren't working at cross purposes, and B, they wanted somebody that could deal with the, uh, uh, with the overseas economies because uh, we do involve leaders in some of our activities um, and sometimes the leaders don't talk to anybody if they don't have sort of ambassador in front of your name. So they said, okay, Mahalik, you go and do this. So it's a, it's a fantastic job um, and I've been going around the region and around the United States talking about APEC and trying to increase private sector involvement uh, in APEC. Now the United States did a really cool thing this year. Instead of having these 130 or 200 meetings scattered all over the country, which is what many of the hosts uh, often do, the United States decided that we would cluster all of those meetings around each one of the four senior official meetings. We did this because the United States is the world's only first world country with a third world budget. And so in order to save money, we decided, well, let's just cluster them all together. We'll save a ton of money. But the unintended consequence of that is that it was great for us, great for the private sector, because uh, it created enormous targets of opportunity, because all of the government officials were going to be in one place at one time. We could predict when it was, and we could set up a number of events uh, with, uh, that would involve both the private sector and, and the government. So the, uh, at the first senior official meeting, we had uh, a couple of receptions and, and some events where the private sector representatives would, would meet the new Psalms and talk with them and, and begin to, to form a relationship. The second meeting, the trade minister's meeting, was held in Big Sky, Montana. It's uh, very hard to get to, let me tell you. But once you're there, it's a beautiful venue. It's, it's, it's uh, very gorgeous. And we did a number of uh, seminars there, um, which were really cool because it was the off season, so the rates were really cheap, and we could get these little chateaus that had fireplaces in them. And so we would have groups of, of uh, 15 to 20 uh, private sector representatives plus uh, the ministers, the uh, trade ministers and uh, staff at three different uh, uh, locations. One of them talked about energy security, one of them talked about food security, and one of them talked about next generation trade issues. 
And the feedback that we got from the ministers was fantastic. One of the ministers came up to me and said, you know, that is the first time I've ever sat down with somebody from the private sector, and they've got some good ideas. And I thought, gee, that's nice. <laughs> well, you know, whatever it takes. At the third uh, meeting, which just ended like, uh, God, about a week ago, I think, it was down in San Francisco. And we had three or four different events that we did there. We did one event, which was kind of a follow-on from the original energy seminar. We did another uh, energy seminar at which we invited energy ministers. And I think about 10 uh, ministers came. Uh, Secretary Chu from our own Department of Energy was there. And it was also the first time that we, uh, the, the government, had put together a meeting of energy ministers and transportation ministers. And they were talking about the intersection of uh, green growth uh, and transportation. So in order to, to augment that event, um, FedEx has a big bonded uh, facility down in San Francisco. And we took a portion of that and set up a little track and invited the APEC economies to send their green growth transportation vehicles there. So we had a number of electric vehicles from, from China, from uh, Japan, from the United States, I think even from Korea. We had uh, a clean air garbage truck. We had uh, electric motorcycles. We had charging stations. Um, and it was just an excellent venue for the companies that are working in this field to meet with many of the ministers and to talk to them about what kind of regulatory environment do we need in order to proceed uh, with the electrification of our transportation system. Then we also had another seminar on health where we again invited health ministers. We had Secretary Sibelius from Health and Human Services there uh, and, and talked a lot about uh, non-infectious diseases because all of the health ministers were going from the APEC meeting to New York, to the UN, where they were going to be uh, discussing this subject with all of their, their UN colleagues. So it was again a good opportunity to, to have, the, uh, have the input into, into the APEC process. But the biggest event of the year is in uh, Honolulu. With, uh, with the leaders. There we do an event called the CEO Summit. The CEO Summit is the best event for CEOs to come and meet with leaders of the 21 uh, APEC economies. And usually these meetings are really boring. I mean, you have uh, 21 leaders, uh, all of whom want to stand up and give 15 minute addresses saying how great their economy is and will you please come and invest in my economy and everybody sits in the audience and takes pictures of the leaders and doesn't listen to what they say, and that's usually the CEO summit. Well, we're gonna shake that up quite a bit this year. We're gonna really shake it up. Uh, first of all, we're saying no speeches. You guys come, and we'll give you an opportunity to make a five or 10 minute video, and you give us the video, and we will release it before the, on the day that the, uh, the conference starts, but at the conference, uh, there are two rules. One of them is you got to have a conversation. You can't just sit there. You can't just sit there and make a speech. You got to have a conversation either with CEOs or with uh, uh, you know people like Charlie Rose or Maria Bartiromo or people like that. Uh, and no PowerPoint. I'm sorry for you guys who love PowerPoint, but no, that's uh, that's death by PowerPoint is what we call it. Um, and this year we're going to have a number of interactions which are going to allow the CEOs to deal not exactly one-on-one -on -one, but in small groups with the leaders uh, going forward. Now where does academia fit in here? Again, I think Don kind of talked yesterday a little bit about the, uh, about the APEC study centers and we use the APEC study centers throughout the year generally in, in trying to set up seminars where we try to publicize APEC and talk about some of the things that APEC has done and what is on the agenda this year. If you're interested in what's on the agenda this year, the U.S. government uh, has got three major priorities that it's working on. One of them is regional economic integration, which again is going to look at things like TPP. It's going to look at other ideas for free trade area of the Asia Pacific, and it will delve into a lot of the minutia that I mentioned earlier, things like rules of origin and customs uh, clearances and cross-cutting uh, cross issues, which I'll talk about a little bit later. The second major priority is green growth. Green growth means sustainability. Uh, it means uh, 
uh, it means in the transportation sector, it would mean uh, uh, looking at, at uh, how do we convert from uh, fossil fuels to something else, or how do we use fossil fuels more, more efficiently uh, until we can convert to something else. Uh, and it also contains uh, an element of, uh, uh, of the WTO, sort of. You know, for the past 10 years, the WTO has been trying to work on uh, EGS, Environmental Goods and Services. And they've been trying to come up with a list uh, that we would all agree would to have zero tariffs on. And for 10 years, they've been arguing about it, and they can't seem to come to an agreement on it. So uh, as we did with the uh, information technology equipment this year, the U.S. government is trying to work on uh, coming up with a list that at least the APEC economies can agree on, and then we'll take that list into the WTO, should the WTO still be alive at that time, and uh, try to get it passed in the WTO. And then the final objective for, uh, for this year is uh, what we call, or what the government calls, uh, regulatory coherence and cooperation. And this is one of the biggest cross-cutting issues uh, that we have, one of the big issues that's going to be in the, the TPP, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And what it, what it means is that you have uh, trying to move goods and services around the APEC area, you've, you've got a number of uh, uh, investment rules, you've got a number of uh, uh, permits that you have to get, a number of certifications, and most of these rules and certifications are what we call behind the border issues. In other words, you, it doesn't happen at the border, it's done usually by one of the domestic agencies within whatever economy you're trying to export to. So regulatory coherence tries to look for ways in which we can, maybe harmonization is the wrong, is the wrong word, but get some common principles or, or common ideas on how you do these sorts of regulations so that it's not a, a starting from ground zero every time you export. If you do an export to Malaysia, then when you do it to Indonesia, you don't have to start at ground zero. There will be a lot of commonalities in the way in which they, they set up their rules and regulations. It's a very complex subject. It's a, a very difficult subject, uh, but it's one that would make a huge difference to trade and investment throughout the, uh, throughout the APEC region. So listen, let me, let me stop there. Um, Maybe I just, there were just a couple of things that were said uh, earlier today that uh, reminded me of a couple of anecdotes, so maybe I'll close with those. One of them, you remember Professor Wasserstrom was talking about, you know, is, uh, are the Chinese communists or not? And uh, I remember uh, I was in China in, uh, God, when the hell was that? That must have been uh, 1992, I think it was, and every year, Every year we had to get a, a human rights waiver uh, for China because of uh, one of the acts of Congress. Um, and this year we gave China the waiver, but we conditioned it on uh, some favorable results on some human rights cases that we'd been working on with, uh, with China. And uh, we knew the Chinese were going to be furious. We knew they were going to be furious about this. So uh, sure enough, the announcement came out that, that uh, it passed the, the Congress with these, uh, these conditions on it. And the next day, myself and one of my colleagues from the embassy were called in to the foreign ministry. And uh, the director general for the Americas, Swin Jun Yu, was there. And he was furious. And he said, do you know what really makes us mad? And we said, no, what's that? And he said, you, your president called us communists. <laughs> And we looked at it and we said, but you are. And he said, yeah, but we don't call you imperialists. <laughs> I thought, so I don't know, are they communists or not? <laughs> and the other thing was when uh, we were talking about the homogeneity of the, uh, of the Japanese people. And uh, the Japanese people do consider themselves to be very special. I remember we were doing trade negotiations with the Japanese on two occasions. One of them was beef, and I have worked on beef with Japan for, I would say, seven years. That's amazing. But, but the reason that we, in the early days, the reason we could not export our beef into, uh, into uh, Japan, and I swear the guy with a perfectly straight face said this to me, he said, well, because the Japanese are different, uh, our intestine is two feet longer than yours. And this means that we can't digest your beef. 
<laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and then the second time, the second time, again, it was a, a U.S. company <laughs> which was trying to sell ski equipment into Japan. <laughs> and again, with a perfectly straight face, this guy says, well, no, 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 you have to go through this ridiculously uh, strict uh, testing requirement because Japanese snow is different from American snow. <laughs> So, uh, this has been a great conference, <laughs> and, uh, and I hope that we'll continue to talk more about internationalization. But if you have some questions either on, on APEC or on Vietnam or on any of the countries within Southeast Asia, I'd be more than happy to, to try to answer them. Yes, sir. How difficult is it to export into Vietnam Inc.? And part two, how difficult is it uh, to set up an operation there, say, compared to China? Oh, compared to China, I'd say it's easier. Uh, it definitely is easier to export into, uh, into Vietnam, uh, and it's also easier to set up a business there. You can, technically, you can set up 100% subsidiary uh, in Vietnam, but uh, I would be real careful when you do that. Um, there are so many rules and regulations within Vietnam. The bureaucracy is formidable, and it's hard to deal with. But, uh, uh, but Technically speaking, you can do that. Exporting into Vietnam uh, is, not, is not that difficult. You do have to put up with all of the same problems you have in most emerging economies. There are corruption issues. There are uh, permit issues and things of that nature. But they're no more difficult than you'll find in most other places and probably a little bit easier. The thing that I think makes Vietnam different uh, is that the government is very open to uh, uh, having frank and serious discussions with people that want to do business in Vietnam. Um, if you've got a problem, um, you know, you, the first stop should be the Foreign Commercial Service and the U.S. Embassy, but we often uh, find out who the appropriate officer is within the Vietnamese government, and then the, the company just goes and talks to them direct, and, and nine times out of ten, they can work it out. When they can't, then they come back to the embassy and we try to work it out for them. Yes. How does the internal American debate over um, uh, government should get out of the way so the private sector take care of everything and the economy and the world will be better off play out in uh, AVAC and APEC kind of things, uh, not only with the American side of it, but from the other countries too? Well, uh, we had a whole, uh, geez, um, Australia during, uh, during the Australia year. Uh, they had a big initiative on regulatory reform that was kind of rooted in exactly that proposition. And the proposition itself is probably not a real true proposition because you do need regulations on certain things for safety reasons, for uh, uh, non-proliferation reasons, for, for other reasons. So the real question is how do you get to a place where you have appropriate regulation and to the greatest extent possible get, get government the heck out of the way. And most of the people that I work with fully subscribe to that. And the real argument is over what's appropriate and what's not. And that's why having the private sector sit down and talk with the government uh, usually does end up with us being able to work some stuff out. So uh, one of the biggest things that, uh, well, it's not actually APEC, but export controls are a huge issue for American business because uh, an awful lot of things which we, we export controls say that you can't export um, certain kinds of Apple computers that you can buy anywhere here in the United States and that you can buy the equivalent of anywhere overseas. Uh, and trying to get the government to realize that and then to make the change in the, in the regulations as necessary is very hard. But if we didn't have ways for the private sector to talk to the government, it just wouldn't happen. It would be horrible. So I think, uh, again, with, with APEC, and APEC, by the way, of all of the organizations, you know, ASEAN or the East Asian Summit or uh, any of the other organizations within Asia Pacific I can think of, the uh, uh, APEC is the only one that does have this, this institution for, for private sector input. Uh, and we've just found over the years that it's been invaluable for, for most of our companies. You can do it through, a, uh, through APEC, you can do it through uh, individual lobbying from company to, uh, uh, to government, um, but I think that APEC is, is a real good way to, to get a lot of that stuff done. Yes, ma'am. When you said that you didn't start your life as a, when you 
when you said you didn't start your life as an international traveler and kind of in an international way, um, how did you get connected to such an international life? And um, since we have many students in Oregon who, for economic reasons and family background reasons, don't see the need to have an international awareness and then eventually maybe to travel internationally, or they don't see um, yeah. that, how that's going to happen for them or why that would be important. What, how did you? Start that life, and what advice would you give them? Well, that's <laughs> I actually, uh, well, I actually started out working for NASA. Um, I'm actually a rocket scientist by training. <laughs> I have I have a master's degree in physics, and uh, was working at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, and then NASA's budget started to get cut, and I thought, oops. <laughs> my my project was. At that time, this will tell you how old I am, but my project at that time was a, a new and untested uh, technology that many people were working on called holography. And uh, we were working on uh, things called holographic non-destructive testing. And basically, I was the only guy on the whole base that knew what I was doing. And so when budgets started to get cut, I thought, well, let me see, which project do you think will go first? The one that everybody knows about? or this one over here that there's one person in the whole base who knows anything about it. So I thought I should look around for other opportunities. <laughs> and uh, uh, Goddard Space Center is in Greenbelt, Maryland. And um, most of us uh, who were there uh, on, on the base used to go down into Georgetown, Washington, D.C., very close. So we used to go down there on weekends and stuff. And I met an awful lot of Foreign Service officers. And I thought, geez. <laughs> These guys are a heck of a lot more interesting than most of the engineers that I work with every day. <laughs> so, so literally, just for the hell of it, I uh, sat for the Foreign Service exam, and uh, I passed by one point. <laughs> and, uh, and nobody ever asked me my score. So. <laughs> so that's how I got into the business. Um, but it just uh, quite. I, I just think that the world today is such that you can't uh, you can't be aware of what's happening in the world without understanding what a huge effect everybody else has, and that was one of the issues that uh, again uh, Professor Wasserstrom was saying is that other countries matter. Other countries matter when you're talking about China. Other countries matter when you're talking about the United States. You know something that the Germans do. Is, is going to affect whether we have a double dip recession or not here over the course of the next couple of months. And whatever the Chinese do in the South China Sea could affect whether or not there's going to be a, you know, a real, well, I don't want to say shooting war, but some serious incidents happening, uh, happening out over there. Uh, and now, my God, even, even Canada is making huge claims in the Antarctic. And do you think the U.S. is going to stand for that? Well, I don't know. but. Uh, <laughs> If, if we don't, then, so again, it's just a, a, a matter of every time you look at the TV, uh, there is something internationally that's going to come and affect you. I mean, and even if you live under a rock or something, you might be interested in, you know, one of the latest murder cases that's happened out in the Bahamas or out in the Europe or something like that. So, and it, it just seems that, that kids just travel today. I, I don't know. Well, I do know why my daughter does it. I mean, she, she grew up in Japan and grew up living in various countries around the world. But even her friends, all of her friends in high school, uh, summer vacation came and they said, well, yeah, we're going to go and visit so-and-so in, uh, in Europe or so-and-so down in Latin America. Uh, my other daughter uh, was, is studying biology and she went down to, Latin, uh, to Central America all the time looking at birds and other weird creatures that live in the rainforest. Uh, so it, it just seems like it's more a part of their lives than it ever was a part of mine. Um, and it's seminars like this. It's talking to people like yourselves who are then going to go back to your classrooms and are going to say, well, do you know how this thing is going to affect your uh, uh, how you deal with, with business if you're going to do a business major or, uh, you know, as Tom is saying, he's teaching Chinese literature and talking about how each one of those uh, sayings that come out of Chinese literature are a part of the way in which a whole other society thinks. Uh, Confucius, everybody hears about Confucius and everybody hears about Lao Tzu and uh, various Eastern philosophers and it's always kind of 
an interesting sort of a thing. People wonder, man, what's this Zen stuff all about, really? And the more that you talk about that with, your, with the kids and the more opportunities that they have to, to do studies abroad or to go on, uh, uh, I don't know, internships with uh, a foreign company or something like that, the better off they're going to be and the more foreign students that they meet. I, mean, I tell the Vietnamese all the time, I say, you guys are much better ambassadors for your country than I am. So you guys get over there to the U.S. and you talk to the American students and tell them something about Vietnam. And I think those are the ways that these things, that these things will happen. And I think they will happen. I, I have no doubt about it. And I think PCC is in a really good position, not only to do your own two-year thing, but to look with, uh, with PSU, for instance, and, and become a feeder or become part of you know, some 2 plus 2 program that, uh, that they're doing or that some other uh, college or university is doing. There are plenty of opportunities, and I think, I think you're a very well placed to take advantage of those. Okay, there it is. Yes, sir. So, Ambassador, can you briefly compare and contrast how were uh, President Clinton and President Obama being received by the Vietnamese people? Received by? The Vietnamese people? The by the Vietnamese people? people? Correct. Compare and contrast and how the Vietnamese people received uh, President Clinton and President Obama. Well, the president of Vietnam, the last president of Vietnam, they have a new president now, but the last president of Vietnam, President Chet, was just overjoyed to have a chance to meet uh, Obama at the UN. They met at the UN uh, a couple of times, I think. The new president of Vietnam, President Song, is, uh, is really, 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 really wanting to, uh, wanting to, meet, uh, wanting to meet Obama. When, uh, uh, during the elections, it was, uh, it was amazing. I was uh, on a trip to uh, somewhere in central Vietnam. Yeah, it was in the central highlands, as a matter of fact. And uh, we were talking with some Communist Party members who had just come back from a trip to the United States. And uh, I remember there were th four of them. And they were asking me about the elections. They said, well, is Hillary going to run? Is she going to run, you know? And I said, well, I don't know. And, and then they, they talked about, I don't even remember what the issue was now, but they knew more about the U.S. elections than I did. And I asked, I said, okay, let's take a straw poll right here. Who would you vote for? And it, it split up exactly the same way as it did in the U.S. The, uh, the, uh, the woman said, Hillary. The, uh, the older guy uh, said, uh, uh, McCain. Uh, <laughs> The middle guy, uh, or the other two, said, well, we think Obama. And it was, uh, for a long time, I would, I would just go around and do this at, at every meeting that I had. And it, again, it mirrored the United States. At the beginning, there were a lot of people about evenly split between Hillary and, uh, uh, and Obama. And uh, most of the uh, conservative folks liked McCain. But McCain, of course, has got a special history with Vietnam. So everybody liked him anyway. Um, but then, right about a month away from the election, you could just see there was like this landslide that moved over to, to Obama. And we did an, uh, we did an election, uh, election party uh, at one of the hotels there. And we must have had, oh God, I don't know, maybe a couple of hundred uh, Vietnamese there. And it was, boy, you should have seen the party when uh, you know, Obama went over the top. Everybody was yelling and screaming. It was, it was incredible. It was really amazing. It's one of the things that I really like about the job. You get to do all kinds of neat stuff like that. Of course, you also got to talk about human rights, which is oftentimes a difficult discussion, but it goes with the territory. OK, well, listen. Yes, Sarah, one more. <laughs> And you know, I, I wonder, it seems to me like no one has a clue how to solve some of our economic problems. And, um, yes, so don't ask me. <laughs> um, I pick up from your conversation that um, free trade is a good thing. And um, of course, a lot of people, labor unions and so on in this country, uh, are very concerned about loss of jobs. And I was wondering if the people in uh, APEC, both leaders and the folks you deal with uh, could care less whether or not we lose our jobs. We could care less whether or not you, I don't think anybody puts it that way. 
I think, uh, <laughs> I think what they say is they would like to see uh, the GDP in all of the APEC countries go up so that the quality of life improves for all people throughout the APEC region. Um, but are they going to do something that will hurt themselves to make sure that we have more jobs? I don't think so. So I think the idea is that trade is a non-zero sum game. That if you do make the pie bigger, then that means that you can have more people have pieces of it. And that's the, that's the overall goal. Uh, and it's very clear that there is not enough domestic demand in the United States to enable us to grow at a rate that is going to, uh, that's going to bring down the unemployment rate. So if we can't do it from domestic demand, where do we have to go to find demand for our products? And that's overseas. So it just seems to me that, you know, if you think that by increasing, uh, by doubling our exports, we are going to be at a net loss of jobs in the United States, I would really like to see that calculation because I just can't see that happening. It's got to increase, uh, it will definitely increase the number of jobs in the United States and it's been shown that export related jobs tend to be higher paying than uh, other, other types of jobs. And as I said, for SMEs, there is a clear, again, you got, we got some facts there to show, 35% increase in their revenues. So, yeah, I think it's a win-win situation. There are losers in our economy, that's true. And that's again where, where institutions like community colleges uh, make a difference. When somebody does need retraining, when somebody does need to figure out, okay, my job just did get cut, what the hell am I gonna do now? Hopefully, if TAA passes, we'll be able to, to fund some programs whereby uh, colleges uh, like this one can help those people, retrain them, and make them ready to find new jobs. Rosy outlook, but the alternative is much worse. Okay, thank you very much.